with more attention being paid to the integration of young and old and the blessing that that can be. Now, all of these kinds of practical areas uh, raise a pressing question, a prior question in a sense, before you get into the practicalities. And that question is, well, how do we think about later life? And I don't just mean pragmatically, how do we think about later life? I mean, how do we think about later life theologically, uh, biblically, quite simply, Christianly? How do we think about later life? Let me just map out some simple distinctions as we start doing that uh, to help us think. First of all, we can distinguish between people in later life as generically people. And on the other hand, the particular features of later life, because of course, humanity, young and old, is humanity. So there's much that remains the same through all the different seasons of life. And a lot of what we say theologically about the old and the young will be exactly the same. We don't forget our theology of being human just because we start talking about later life. But on the other hand, there are particular features of later life and we need to pay close attention to those particular features. When we do that, we can distinguish between the opportunities of later life and the challenges of later life. For example, um, a, a good uh, particular opportunity question would be, how should I spend my retirement? A good particular challenge question might be, how are we to understand the identity of someone with near total memory loss in later life? So we have the generically human and we have the particular to later life. And then within the particular, we can think about both opportunities and challenges. So just hold those sort of distinctions in mind as, as we progress. What I want to do now is to home in on the particular, the particular challenges, opportunities of later life and, and the theological understanding of later life that will help us to grasp them. Now, I am going to cite some grey hair verses, but I want to point out that we need to get beyond just proof text and just plucking those verses out and staring at them in isolation when we think about later life. There's nothing wrong with proof texting uh, Bible verses because Bible texts do prove things. But the risk is that we miss the bigger, wider picture of reality that a, a full orbed Christian theology gives us because it goes way beyond just those particular verses. And actually, when you think about it, there aren't many biblical passages that set out to reflect on the subject of aging in scripture. There aren't many biblical passages that you would say are about later life in scripture. But there are very many passages that speak to later life in scripture, but they often won't be the ones which uh, you might quote about gray hands. So we're interested in the gray hair verses, and I'm going to come to a few of them. Uh, but we can't stop there. Let me give you a, a fundamental claim that underpins everything I'm going to say in a moment. And that is the claim that the Bible reveals the meaning of things. As we wrestle with the challenges and opportunities of human life in all seasons, we're essentially asking the same question. We, we find ourselves asking, don't we, what does this mean? What is the meaning of this event? What's the meaning of this struggle I face in this season of life? Or even perhaps as I'm seeking to minister to somebody else, what's the meaning of this person and their existence and their existence being like this? How am I to view it or him or her? And you can see, can't you, that this is not some sort of airy fairy question. It is a question that is deeply theological, but it's also a question that is going to be obviously going to be supremely practical. I'll give you an example. Think of someone who is so unwell that she cannot actually do anything much beyond existing in a very, very basic 
possible way. Now we know, don't we, that somebody in that situation invariably asks herself, what is the point of my continuing life? Why does the Lord still want me alive, someone may ask. Why doesn't he just take me? I wish he would take me now. Well, that's a question, isn't it? About the meaning of her existence, the very meaning of her daily life. What does it mean? And we know that we don't answer that question for ourselves. God is the one who creates all things and gives all things meaning. He communicates their meaning to us. And of course, we know that he does that in the scriptures. And at, at one level, the big picture answer is the same for everything, isn't it? All things exist for the glory of God. Think of a famous verse like Romans 11:36. for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Jonathan Edwards, great theologian said, God made the world that he might communicate and the creature receive his glory. Everything plays its part in speaking of and thereby declaring the praise and glory of God. And that's what we exist to do to each other. We exist to speak of God to each other. Uh, and please understand, I don't mean just speak with our lips. Obviously, we do that. But I mean that our very existence speaks of God to others. We are created in the image of God to image God to one another. Now that image is ruined in the fall, but restored in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he makes us new creations, as Paul says he does, we image God afresh by being in the image of Christ. So we can ask, how does someone in later life, with all of its particular joys and sorrows, speak of God, image God? like that in their state and stage with its particularities. How is God glorified in the aging person? Well, here we can come to the famous verses, can't we? Because we can identify from scripture and indeed from experience some of the features of later life by going to those verses. So what is later life associated with in scripture? First of all, it's associated, isn't it, with wisdom Think of Job 12, verse 12. Wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. Wisdom is with the aged. Or think of 1 Kings 12, when King Rehoboam loses the north because he follows the advice of the young men, the young men he grew up with. You can tell from the context, uh, he's about 41 at this stage, so they're not that young. He should have listened to those in later life who gave him wiser advice. Think of James chapter one, which tells us how experience, specifically the experience of trials, will bring growing wisdom. So later life in scripture is associated with wisdom. Secondly, it's associated with glory. Here's the famous verse, gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life, Proverbs 16:31. And that glory is meant to be met by others with honour. Leviticus 19.32 tells us, you shall stand up before the grey head and honour the face of an old man. Paul, remember, tells Timothy to speak to older men as he would to a father. Or how are we to speak to our fathers? We are to, as the commandments tell us, to honour our fathers. So later life should come with glory and with honour as well as with wisdom and scripture also recognizes doesn't it that later life can be characterized by increasing weakness psalm 71 verse 9 do not cast me off in the time of old age forsake me not when my strength is spent or well, think of that grim catalog in ecclesiastes chapter 12 of evil days. 
So if you go to those verses, the famous verses, and you say, well, what characterizes, what is particular to later life? Wisdom, glory, honor, weakness. These will then help us see the meaning of later life, because it's not just a case of us looking at these verses and saying, oh, that's nice. OK, wisdom, glory, honor, weakness. Fine. And then we stop thinking. We need now to think theologically about those realities of later life. And when we do that, those things take us somewhere extraordinary because we find they all come together somewhere else in the Bible. And that place is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross, remember, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, is the wisdom of God. The cross, amazingly, given how horrific it was, in John's Gospel, is the glory of Christ. It is the hour of his glory. Think, for example, of uh, John chapter 12. The cross for the Lord Jesus is his pathway to honour. Remember the sequence of Philippians 2, as, as, as Christ takes on the form of a, a servant and goes down to death, even death on the cross, and then as a result of that obedience is exalted and given the name above every name. It's the pattern also of Isaiah 53. So wisdom, glory, honour, and of course, obviously, weakness is a theme of the cross. Again, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that the cross is the weakness of God. So the particular features of later life, as scripture itself identifies them, are strikingly coincident with the features of Christ crucified. Now, the fact that the themes of later life are the themes of Christ crucified actually tells us that none of these things is unique to later life because the whole of every Christian life is to be cross-shaped, is to be cruciform. Remember, we, as we read in Mark 8, we take up our cross and follow Jesus, don't we? So we are all to be cross-shaped through the whole of our Christian life. It's not as if there's, there's no connection to the wisdom, glory, weakness of the cross for a younger Christian. But usually scripture itself tells us these things become more evident in later life and indeed can come to dominate it. So that the elderly saint in our midst, and this is you if you're an elderly saint on this call, are in particular signs of the wisdom, glory, honor, and weakness that is supremely manifest in Christ himself. Now you may well think at this point, well, how can that be? And is that right? Can we really share in those things which are Christ's? Well, yes, we can. The Bible is very emphatic, isn't it, in our union with Christ and our sharing with Christ. Theologian John Murray said, nothing is more central or basic than union and communion with Christ. And you can think of the glorious analogies that he used in the New Testament, many of them picking up on the Old Testament. Christ and the church are like husband and wife, foundation and building, the vine and the branches, the head and the members. All these images emphasize our union with Christ. And in John 17, the Lord Jesus himself even compares the unity that we have with Christ to the unity between the Father and the Son in the Godhead. So because we are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, joined fundamentally by his spirit, by the Holy Spirit, therefore, the things which are manifest in Christ crucified can be manifest in his people. And wisdom, glory, honour and weakness can be particularly manifest in the saint in later life. So the meaning of godly later life is that it images Christ and we see Christ in his people. By imaging him, it glorifies him. And the really striking thing is that it does that even when from the point of view of the individual experiencing it, life is at its hardest at its worst when the individual is at his or her 
weakest. Because that is exactly what the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is like. Let me draw four implications from this. First of all, the mix of things that scripture associates with later life tells us that it's not to be defined as a problem. The picture of aging in the Bible is mixed. Honour feels good. Weakness does not feel good. So we mustn't mentally define becoming old as a problem. Secondly, the fact that it's a scale and not a line, that somebody doesn't suddenly start manifesting wisdom, glory, honour and weakness, but that those things are true to a lesser degree of the whole of Christian life, the fact that the whole of the Christian life is cruciform, the fact that there is weakness even in the young, answers our question we have about how we prepare people for later life. Fundamentally, the answer must be, well, we're doing that all along, because these particular things that come upon us with intensity in later life don't come out of nowhere. They are characteristic, perhaps to a lesser degree, of the whole of Christian existence. Now, this doesn't rule out particular teaching for those facing later life. But the deep foundations need to be long laid in the church's teaching. We are discipling people for their later life throughout every age by teaching about these features, especially perhaps about weakness, through the whole of life, because it's characteristic of the cruciform existence of every Christian. Thirdly, the fact that older people point to the wisdom, glory, honour and weakness of Christ, to whom they are joined by the Spirit, has a wonderful, dignifying effect on later life for the godly, for the believer. This should have a transformative effect on our self-perception, and especially on the self-perception of those who face severe weakness and who are so tempted to measure their own existence by worldly standards and to think that there is no point to it. Weakness is a problem, of course. It is an intrusion that results from sin, like death is an intrusion. But God has so transformed weakness that it can become a sign of Christ crucified. So that the person facing weakness is perhaps more than others imaging Christ and therefore there is dignity even in and perhaps precisely in weakness not in utility or productivity but in our weakness and that should transform how we see ourselves in our weakness but also of course how we see others and how the church treats them and we should treat them as we would treat Christ himself. Fourthly our union with Christ, remembering our union with Christ, which is the ground of our likeness to Christ in later life, has a securing effect on the identity of believers with dementia. The godly in later life image Christ because they're united to him by the Holy Spirit, not because they're united to him by their memory or because their memory works. Union with Christ is decreed in eternity, Ephesians 1 tells us. It's effected by the irrevocable indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it rests first and foremost, not on me knowing God consciously or articulately, but on God knowing me. There's a very striking moment in Galatians 4 where Paul corrects himself. He says, now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, there's a, a reassuring asymmetry of knowledge in the relationship between God and us. If my knowledge of him is affected by dementia, or at least my ability to express it, I can know and those around me can know that his knowledge of me is never similarly affected. The Bible amazingly speaks about babies in the womb trusting in God. Psalm 22, 9 to 10 does that. Think about John the Baptist who leaps in the womb when his mother approaches Mary. Our spiritual capacity 
is not measured by our ability to express things with our lips or even, even to formulate them consciously in our minds. So can I encourage you then as I finish to see the world the way that God describes it, the way that he reveals it, to understand the meaning of the realities, bitter and sweet of later life, as God explains them. Will you find in your own later life or in the prospect of it or in the later life of those around you, the likeness of Christ in his wisdom, glory, honour and weakness? Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us your eyes to see ourselves and to see those around us. And we ask it for the glory of the Lord Jesus and in his name. Amen.